Hi, Pat Ziemer from MagnaWave. As you, many of you know, we manufacture and sell high voltage pulsed electromagnetic therapy equipment. So that's our primary business, but we have supplements and complementary items that are part of our line. The question I'm always asked is, why do you have these products as part, as part of your line? Why do you pick up other products? Well, the answer is very simple. There are many complementary modalities out there that it simply enhance the use of our product or our product enhances the use of those products. And so we look for things, things that basically we've used and something we've been exploring for a couple of years is hemp and uh, for various reasons. And recently this year, we got involved with hemp because it works and it helped someone very close to me with their PTSD. And when it does that, then we want to look at how we can add that to our line and help other people as well. We do do a lot of work with depression, with anxiety, certainly pain and everything that we do. So we look for these kind of products. Ananda Hemp, is that type of product for us. It works for us, it works for my family, it works for many of our people who are currently using it. So that's why we do this. And so what I wanna to do today is I wanna have a conversation with Eric Wong, the CEO of Ananda, and he's gonna tell us about some of the background, some of the legal ramifications, and all those types of questions that we receive all the time. So Eric, thank you for being with me. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, thanks Pat, I appreciate it. Listen, I think probably my, my background is a bit different from, from hemp. Um, graduated from West Point, spent about eight years active duty in the military, um, went off to business school and then went to, to Australia to work. And it was at that point in time that I met a gentleman named Barry Lambert. And Barry Lambert became a very close friend of mine. And his granddaughter actually suffered from a disease called Dravet syndrome and had severe epileptic seizures that she couldn't control. And when she was about two years old, um, was in a state where probably was going to be either um, crippled for life or, or pass away. And so the family actually, as a last resort, went and sourced some hemp from Europe, um, brought it illegally into Australia, and miraculously in a very short period of time, the seizures were under control and stopped. And she became a very healthy young little girl now, sort of four years on. It was after that, six months after that happened, the Lambert family went ahead and realized that the rest of the world need to understand what's going on with industrial hemp and the benefits of CBD as a, as a molecule. And they made a donation of $34 million to the University of Sydney to set up the Lambert Initiative that would eventually go ahead and look to find out, improve the efficacy of cannabis for safe use. After that, about six months later, um, the Lamberts um, gave me a call and asked me if I would help them to figure out how to solve the affordability and accessibility issue. And it was at that time that Mr. Lambert and I came to the United States and we met with Brian Furnish, who's now the director of global production um, for Amanda Hemp. Um, and Brian will tell the story. He was actually the lead architect with, um, at that time, the Agricultural Commissioner and now Congressman James Comer to put in place the industrial hemp laws as part of the 2014 Farm Bill, which made it legal for us to grow, process, produce, distribute, and sell um, hemp products across the United States um, which is now called the Nana Hemp. So that's a bit of our background. So we will get into the uh -huh. background, the history from with Brian from the farming side of things, but a question that we're often asked, and I know the Farm Bill has eliminated a lot of this, but what about the legality sure. across the country? Yeah. It's always asked, and people are always frightened by that. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, it, it's a very, very important question, and to be honest, it's one people have to be very careful of what we do, Okay. So what it says in the 2014 Farm Bill, Section 7606, is that any product from a legally grown hemp field or crop, um, that product is legally be processed and distributed and sold across the United States so long as it passes its tests and maintains a THC level of below 0.3%. So to be really clear, the product cannot come from a marijuana plant. It has to come from an industrial hemp plant. It has to be grown in a state with a program that's established and legal, um, and all the, the um, processes and documentation has to follow specific guidelines to be legal. So what you have right now is you have a lot of products out there that are either hemp or call themselves hemp, but they're actually marijuana-derived products, or they're not grown in the United States and imported from Europe and China. So it's a very fine line to run on this thing, Pat, and it's a pretty important line to watch because, like I said, falling afoul of the DEA or 
any enforcement agency is not what anyone needs to do. So one of the things that you said was uh, cannot be grown from marijuana or yeah. produced from marijuana. So to be legal in the farm bill, it has to be manufactured from an actual hemp plant. Yeah. So I'll give you, so the difference between hemp and marijuana is it's one simple thing, and, and that's the molecule called THC. Okay, so hemp and marijuana are both come from the cannabis sativa L family, and there are about 2,000 different um, land races of cannabis that are known right now. But what happens is they test for one molecule, THC, and THC is actually the molecule that has a psychoactive component to it. So 0.3% is the set standard in the farm bill right now. And that is, um, and that basically means if you're in the field of hemp, which we grow open field, uh, there is zero chance of it being having any narcotic value or anyone getting high off of that. So diverting hemp into a illegal drug is, is virtually impossible. So that's the big test that they have. And for example, our crops get tested before they get harvested. The products get tested before they get distributed. And obviously, if we ever, if products ever got tested by the DA, they would pull it off the shelf and test it to make sure it was below the 0.3%. So that's the important part of marijuana and hemp. One is a drug on Schedule 1, and the other one is a a plant. Hemp is a plant, marijuana is a drug. But it, the hemp itself is still on the DEA list or is it not? No, so hemp grown under this under this um, under these parameters of the farm bill, okay, fall outside of the Controlled Substances Act. Oh, okay. so they really don't have to change anything to make it no. So it's it, it is legal to go yes. into the 50 states as long as it's grown within the regulations that exactly. you have. Cuz hemp is a crop, it's a plant. It's not a drug because by itself it can't be used for diversion. But the important part too, Pat, people realize is that CBD, which is a one of the 130 different molecules from the cannabis plant, which most people know about, CBD that comes from marijuana or CBD that comes from hemp is CBD. It's the same. THC that comes from marijuana or THC that comes from hemp is the same. Okay, so the molecule doesn't change its component. It's just the quantity of it inside that single plant is where the difference is. So there are products on the market that come in from some states that are derived from marijuana? Yes, that happens right now, and they may call them hemp, but they're actually derived from a marijuana plant. So those products, okay, will not necessarily fall under the protection of Section 7606 of the Farm Bill. Okay, but yours do, which means they can be grown at your farm in Kentucky. Yes. And exported to all 50 correct. states legally. Correct. Uh, with with no issues. Yeah, correct. And so one, one example of what happened is, so last month we participated in a, in a convention for the NCPA, the National Community Pharmacy Association. And so as some people know that's actually the head agency for all the independent pharmacies, 22,000 of them in the United States. So we spent a very long time going back and forth with their legal counsel and our legal counsel, explaining to them where our product comes from and how we do it all. And so we were the only, first and only CBD company has been allowed to be part of their convention. And as you know, pharmacies, the DEA holds all the pharmacies licenses because they're schedule one, they carry schedule one products. So uh, you have materials, I'm sure, or we'll have materials at our, uh, at our use where a chiropractor or a doctor that's using this in their practice will be able to show someone the legality of all of this so people sure. can understand. Absolutely. We provide a legal opinion, and so our lawyers, as Brian will talk about, were the ones that helped actually draft the original hemp legislation that was part of Section 7606. So we'll provide the legal opinions, and as necessary, we actually work within states to support our customers. So Indiana was a classic example. Our products were in a lot of Indiana stores. The um, excise and alcohol tax um, enforcement agency raided a lot of stores and took all the different CBD products off the shelves. Our lawyers went to Indianapolis, met with the governor's office, explained what happened, and within about three weeks, it was clarified, and a clear statement was made that these products are legal in Indiana. Did they give them back to you, or did they keep them? Uh, I, I don't actually, I don't actually know what happened within the stores, but uh, I think they got them all back from them. Right. I believe, yes. So, all right. So, 
I'll give you an example of a firsthand experience that I had just a couple of weeks ago, and then you can give me some more background on what it does. But I'm at a trade show, and I'm and a woman comes up to me, and she looks at it, and she reads about it, and she said, I suffer from severe PTSD, mm-hmm. and I don't like taking the drugs that I take. Do you think this will help me? And I said, well, from personal experience, I feel that it will help you mm-hmm. with that type of indication. She took two tablets came back the next day and was sold. She said, I haven't had anything that's approached my disability the way this has done Mm -hmm. it. So now we can talk about PTSD. What other issues has it been used for? Where do you see the development as far as how a doctor or a chiropractor or someone may implement this into their practice? Absolutely. So I think I'll probably start off by making a huge disclaimer, which I need to be careful of. So we don't make claims because um, it's very important. We work with the FDA. Uh, we work with universities in terms of research, obviously via the Lambert Center and Lambert Initiative, but not making claims is a very important thing until the formal clinical trials are completed. So with that caveat in mind, Pat, what we do see in terms of anecdotally working, there are three main segments that we see, which include pain, sleep, and anxiety. Um, you know, from a pain point of view, you know, a lot of the research is pointing towards a very strong anti-inflammatory um, properties with that. So whether it be neuropathic pain, arthritis, um, fibromyalgia, and those types of things. Um, what we see with sleep is the quality of sleep goes up is what we understand. So, you know, CBD won't put you to sleep. It's not a soporific, but it will improve the quality of sleep um, that someone has. And the last, obviously, is anxiety. Um, and that comes in the form of whether it's stress, whether it's depression, whether it's um, autistic behavioral challenges, you know, that level of, of anxiety comes down. So those are the main things that we hear about. The other things that we do see, where, whether it be um, Tourette's syndrome, helping to, to manage that, uh, epileptic seizures, in some cases it helps. So once again, you know, we don't say this will cure anything. There's no definitive proof that has to be until it's be done, until it's done with the clinical trials. But in terms of quality of life, um, we see an improvement in most people from the quality of life. So how do you dose? How, how do you yeah. determine what the, what this person sure. is going to take? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So part of what the clinical work that's being done is to figure out what the right dosage level is. I think you know the best advice we give to people is this: is that it really depends on severity of what you're going through. It depends on your body's metabolism. Depends on your body weight. So the range of factors. So typically, we advise people to start off with one dose in the evening first to let their body. Um, try and get used to what CBD does. And then we expect people to titrate up. So basically we say titrate to effect. Um, and people will feel it anywhere from one day to one week to two weeks is when they'll start feeling it. But it's about p- keeping a consistent level of the CBD in your system. Um, and like I said, people get to an effect and then they'll stabilize. And sometimes they'll reduce the dosage that they have. And sometimes they'll find themselves having to increase the dosage a little bit because they find that it, it um, the body adjusts to it. So from the standpoint of MagnaWave, we use our devices to enhance the, the, the medicinal value of various products that, that people will take. And so that's why we associate in this type, in this type of situation to enhance the effect of this particular uh, dosage that, that someone may have. We always talk about treat as long as function continues to improve. Then when you reach a plateau, continue to treat as long as it, as, as much as it takes to maintain the plateau. Absolutely. And and you just said that's basically the same thing. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing. And I think when we look at what, what a nano hemp does, you know, a lot of times people use it as, as an, you know, in addition to existing treatments. So I think if your people are using um, MagnaWave's PMF, it's part of, assisting as an additional part of the treatment to actually improve the outcome. And so you have several products here. Yeah. Uh, you've got the, the tablets, the gel caps, you have the salve, and then the tincture. Yeah. What is the, certainly the salve, you can use it to rub on to relieve sure. localized pain, that type of thing, which I do on this thumb right here okay. uh, <laughs> a lot. But tell us about the difference between the, the gel caps and the tincture, how someone sure. would use those in in uh, in concert with each yeah, other. Yeah, absolutely. So what we find is this is, Everyone has a different way they would like to take um, treatment. And so, by and large, the formulas are very similar to themselves. They're CBD heavy, and I'll, I'll explain full spectrum later. It's CBD heavy, but they carry a few other cannabinoids, including a microdose of THC in them. Okay, but what we have is with the tinctures, that the bioavailability is quite fast because it's sublingual and enters the system very quickly. 
However, some people don't like to taste the hemp oil and some people do. So a lot of people prefer to take the gel caps. Um, and the gel caps, once again, you don't really have the taste and they're very precise in terms of dosages in terms of each gel cap. And so sometimes with a lot of children, whether they have epilepsy or Tourette's, we find them not able to swallow gel caps. So they take the tinctures sublingually. A lot of adults will either take the gel caps or the tinctures depending on personal preference on what they feel. Um, the salves came out later, mainly because we find people taking the tinctures started um, putting it topically on their, on their shoulders or arms or bottom of their feet. Um, and so we realized we should just create a salve which is, you know, obviously more towards a um, topical product. So someone who's taking it for pain uh, or anxiety, if they're taking the gel caps and all of a sudden they find themselves in a stressful type situation, the tincture will sublingually will give them a, a relaxation or, or a balance more rapidly. Yes, the tincture will absorb far quicker into the system as opposed to taking the gel cap coming through. Later. So a question that we receive all the time, and it's something that I'm sure our docs are going to be talking about and, and asking the question of, what about testing? Yeah. What about use of this and the testing situation? Sure. Yes. So listen, all the Nano products at this point in time have a microdose of THC, so it's 0.3% or less by volume weight. So there is THC in the product, and depending on the type of drug test taken, there is a chance you can test positive. And we're very clear with our customers on that. Okay. So how do you handle that is probably the next most important question. A lot of people, it doesn't matter. Um, and once again, you're not impaired, so you won't get high off banana hemp. There's no chance of that happening because of the limited amount of THC in there, but it just comes down to the legality of a test. So what, you know, some of the doctors we work with that they do is they actually make sure that their patients go talk to their employer ahead of time and explain to them and show them, this is what I'd like to take. This is what it's for. There's less than 0.3% THC, and it's a legal product. And then they explain to the employer what might happen, and then the employer can make a decision. But our view is full disclosure is always the most important thing to do in any product. Um, and like I said, we've had patients that have not tested positive, and we've had patients that have tested positive. Um, and they have to manage that with their employers and what they do. So that's that's the reality of, uh, of uh, what happens with any of these products. And, and they have that with, with anything they're doing. Any, any type of medication they're taking, they probably have, that's absolutely. probably a pretty fine line there uh, with, with regard to how much they can take and what they're taking. Yeah, absolutely, and that's right. And what we're doing with work at Sydney University with the Lambert Initiative is trying to find out where the impairment level is on THC. So for example, with alcohol, it's been well established 0.8% is the, the legal limit of impairment on, on alcohol. No one's actually figured out what the legal impairment level is on THC. So we're trying to set up a measure of what it is because the reality is, is you know, if you take the Nanda hemp and I take it daily, there's no impairment. But if I were in an accident and it showed up on the test, there is no black and white of where it is and where it isn't. So we're trying to work on setting those standards as part of the professionalism of this industry. And, and that's coming from Sydney? Sydney University is doing that work on driving impairment first is the first test. And now, in, and I know that you've taken the steps to to have medical directors and to establish yourself in, in that regard. We just don't have a farm out here making this product, mixing yeah. it up in the bathtub and, and selling it. We're, we've got the whole, tell us about what's yeah, going on. Yeah, sure, Pat. So, so we're, Ananda Hemp's very fortunate with Barry Lambert as our benefactor. So Barry and Joy Lambert, one's going to put um, personally from donations about $40 million um, into research of of industrial hemp significance. Okay, so you know, don't have to do that. Have you know, it's purely for for the purpose of improving mankind. And so we're fortunate that we work with Sydney University and Thomas Jefferson University. Um, Thomas Jefferson them. here, yes, right. Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, at the Lambert Center, and Sydney University at, in Sydney in Australia, um, to do work on research and, and clinical work to see about the efficacy, dosing, safety. Um, of cannabis-based products. So there is a Lambert Center at Thomas Jefferson. Correct, yes. And so there we're very fortunate to work with, you know, the director of the of the center is Dr. Charles Pollock. Um, and likewise, our medical director is um, Dr. Alex um, Capano. And so Alex Capano, is, and then his medical director, is a nurse practitioner by trade. And she received the first doctorate in cannabinoid therapy in the United States. Um, she finished, I think, about two months ago, 
So we're actually very fortunate to have someone who understands the science behind cannabinoid therapy, who's a practical, you know, hands-on um, medical professional, and who just loves this space and understands it. So we're very blessed to have her on our staff. Can you address a little bit, or perhaps, perhaps this is a question for Dr. Alex at some point in time, but I, it, it's my understanding that we actually have a cannabinoid system in our body that sure. our body needs or reacts yes. to. Yes. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'll, I won't go too technical. But listen, so everyone, Dr. Raphael Meshulam out of Israel, about 40 years ago, discovered something called the endocannabinoid system. And it's quite a new system, and only the medical books are only starting to, to really understand it. But every human body has an endocannabinoid system, and you have two receptors in your body. And the biggest thing about the endocannabinoid system is it helps promote homeostasis in the body. And so... The, the theory, and I guess the hypothesis, is that you know, humans have a deficiency in their endocannabinoid system, much like you would have a deficiency in vitamin E or vitamin D or vitamin C in your system. So over time, our bodies have, have lost that homeostasis. And so by taking cannabinoids from a cannabis plant, you're actually um, improving the level of cannabinoids in your system, and thereby improving all the balances from hormonal balances to um, uh, um, the mental state that you're in, um, in inflammation. So everything your body is meant to control, your endocannabinoid system is improved to help control it much better. Everything you read when you get into a lot of different medications, they'll talk about we need to do this to where you reach good homeostasis of the body and you want that to be and, and so there's there's an eye opener for me to sit here and think that that the application of this can help improve some the homeostasis of someone's body right. which will allow other things to better do their job and the body to better heal itself exactly sleeping better you know your body temperature the blood flow all these things inflammation reduce all the things come back to your body being in a better state Obviously. So we've we've talked about the legal aspects of it being legal in the United States, uh, the testing aspects, mm -hmm. uh, the the balance of the body, what it can do, some various indications that it can be used for, uh, and this is another thing that I've read. There are I forget what it is, and you can clarify this for me. There's 120 or some number sure. of of parts to the cannabinoid yes. system, or not system, but yeah. the cannabinoid. We're using just a few at this point. Sure, exactly. This is probably the most exciting part, Pat. Is Dr. Rafael Mashulam and Mahmoud El Soli out of the University of Mississippi have identified about 130 different cannabinoids. So, cannabinoid CBD is one cannabinoid, THC is one cannabinoid. Okay, and those are the only two that people have any done real, any done real research on. So the other 128, most of them haven't been even identified in terms of standard set yet. But the exciting part about it is all the other cannabinoids that we're developing and growing in the hemp plant right now will will work on different different disease states. Um, strong hypothesis whether it be autoimmune diseases, um, obviously you know uh, epilepsy, you know all these other types of things. That are coming through. Type 2 diabetes are being reviewed right now. So we're only scratching the surface, Pat, and I think this is a pretty exciting part. So actually, it'll be almost, uh, you can, at some point, you can facilitate the manufacturing of this to to use the cannabinoids that approach diabetes or approach specific indications. Yes, that's the hope is that we'll be able to work on that. And that's all about taking a cannabinoid, making it more of a major in the system. So right now, CBD is the primary content of our, our product. And in the future, if they find out, for example, THCV, which is not THC, um, if they prove that that has benefit with type 2 diabetes in terms of managing it, then we'll create a product that is higher in THCV, you know, for that disease state to be specifically done to help people with that. Once again, we have to wait in time for claims to be made. But our product, like I said, we create a nutraceutical product. It's not a pharmaceutical. Uh, we focus on something called full spectrum, so we prefer to have multiple cannabinoids in the product, not a single molecule. Um, nothing is synthetic in what we make. Can you explain full spectrum? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So full spectrum is a really good question. So when people make CBD products, they'll either create it from the isolate, so they'll crystallize CBD, isolate it, and they'll reconstitute it back into a carrier oil. Okay, so that's a single pure molecule of CBD. At the, full, at the other end, you have people what they call full spectrum, which is the oil, the way the plant naturally derived. You extract the oil from it, and you use that as a full spectrum. Now, full spectrum can be as simple as two cannabinoids in it, 
or as many as eight or nine cannabinoids in it. So the big difference is full spectrum isolate are two different categories. And within full spectrum, you can have, there's a whole spectrum, sorry about the pun, of full spectrum from two to eight or nine cannabinoids in them. Now, uh, products that are coming in from outside of the country, mm-hmm. um, is there any regulation on these products or, or where where do you set yourself apart there? Sure. So right now, the way the, the law works is for anything to be a legal hemp product that can be distributed across the 50 states, it has to be grown in the United States in a state that has hemp laws passed with the Department of Agriculture or a university as the owner of the of the um, licenses. So that's a very tight regulation. So basically anything that comes from overseas is not legal as a hemp product and can't be distributed across the 50 states. And the other half, I guess, when people talk about marijuana, so marijuana is a state-regulated product. And so in certain states, you have, you're legalized for recreation marijuana, you're legalized for medical marijuana. But once again, those are state-based laws. So anything sold has to be produced in that state and sold in that state and can't cross the state borders. A lot of good questions that we could go over, and I'm sure we yeah. will. <laughs> Absolutely. So, But I will let Brian talk a little bit more about the, the laws themselves. And then Brian will cover um, the supply chain because he basically is the person from having a seed through to the end product is what Brian does. You know, I think one of the things that, that we talk about and, and people don't really understand the manufacturing process. Mm-hmm. I mean, we understand it grows as a plant and some people have an idea what it looks like, so on and so forth. But what actually goes into the process from the lab, sure. the manufacturing concept, you took me to the lab uh, and it was an incredible Mm-hmm. trip just to the clean room and the, and to see the everything going on tell us a little bit about the process of the manufacturing and the lab process yeah sure absolutely pat i think for us the most important thing there are two things that we're trying to do in our lab one is to make sure that we're doing efficiently at scale which is one thing that's challenging and i think number two is to make sure in terms of the testing and the quality control is a big part of what we do so in terms of the extraction of any material from a plant it's very similar to any essential oils. So people will understand that process. So we take the green material that Brian grows and harvests. And for us, it's about taking the medicinal value off of the plant. So there's an extraction process that we we use and utilizing ethanol. And once the ethanol pulls and separates the plant matter um, from the medicinal, um, we call it cannabinoids in the system, then there's a distillation process to take off the ethanol. And then it's about cleaning the oil as well as possible. So we use a fractional distillation method, which heats it up and uses a centrifuge. And that basically separates the plant matter from the golden oil. And, you know, we're very proud of the quality of the oil that we have. So that process takes a bit longer than most people are willing to take. And the equipment is a bit more significant in terms of, you know, how we manage that. But the output is, like I said, is very high quality. It's very clean. It's very pure in what we do. And we test it four times along the way. Um, whether it be antimicrobial, heavy metals, E. coli, um, all the way through the content testing. So we have four testing stages in our process. And, and this is something that, does everybody do that, that you know of? Yeah, this, I, I, you know, I won't talk about competitors much on this thing, but um, you know, we have one of the, I think, the higher quality, more stringent, and more thorough processes. Um, but the answer is no, not everyone does it this way. and Everyone does it differently. I, I guess it speaks to your quality when you talk about your involvement with, with the University in Sydney and Thomas Jefferson and, and Dr. Alex Capano uh, having the first PhD in, in cannabinoid mm-hmm. sciences, I presume, uh, that you're, going, you're taking those extra steps to make sure that your product is, is total quality from yeah, start to finish. I, I think a philosophy for the company, Pat, is, you know, all the way from the Lamberts to the way the furnishes do things on the farm, it's a big, big deal to us. We don't want to embarrass ourselves or anybody else in what we do. Um, and we were created, you know, to help help patients. And if you think about what happened with Caitlin Lambert, who's Barry's granddaughter, that's what it's about: is creating a high quality product that's affordable, that's accessible, and that's legal. Um, and public safety and um, awareness is. is you know, first and foremost for us. So what we do is really important to do it the right way. So from our perspective at, at MagnaWave, we've put ourselves, our position to be one of quality, one of things that work well together, synergistic effects of our device 
compared with the use of, of your product. Uh, there's a lot of where we understand that the, what the legality with the farm bill and where that puts it as mm -hmm. far as legality. But what about the regulation, the noise within the industry? A lot of people are saying things. Is there a way to, to look and see sure. where companies are, or where they yeah. where they land? I'm not trying to. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Yeah. It's an important thing. I think for you found the same thing in MagnaWave is how do, you know, how do people, you know, understand the quality of PMF and, you know, how do you keep out people making poor machinery and, and things like that. So we're finding the same challenges in our industry. And I think every industry that's new has that issue, whether it's the beef industry, whether it's the feed industry, grain industry, you know, certified organic, all these types of things you have. So Brian chairs a self-regulatory organization that's created with, that has about 35 of the top hemp companies in the country. Um, and what they're working on is creating a set of standards and guidelines that people have to follow if they want to be certified from the self. So almost like Certified Angus Beef is a self-regulatory organization. We want to create the same um, category where pe consumers primarily can check and understand and make sure that what they're purchasing has been done legally, safely, and in compliance with best practices. What about stuff that comes in from out of the country? Is it tested in any fashion? Does it? No. Listen, it comes in and it's it's come in because it's coming in illegally. It's sneaking through the system. And so I think in terms of having quality controls, that's at least the concern. It's basically getting through the borders is the concern with imported product. So talking about getting to the borders, what about if someone is consuming this product and they're going to travel? Sure. Does it travel? Yeah. So I think I'm going to probably put that in different groups of, of categories. So within the United States, it travels. Okay, it's a federally legal product across 50 states. You know, I get on my airplanes with it all the time and travel. If you're going to a country that it's clearly illegal, then it doesn't travel. So as an example, you know, we ship our product to a lot of countries across um, the world right now who order it. But like, for example, I don't ship it to, into Indonesia. Okay, I guess certain countries I know that while it's legal for me to export it, um, consumers are putting themselves at risk if they take it in that country because it's very clearly on the law. So if you're leaving the country, you need to study the laws of that country. If you're staying within the United States, there's no problem. No problem at all. Because there, there are issues with, if, in Colorado, for example, they can do things in Colorado, but they can't bring it out of Colorado. Exactly, yes. But you can go, so, you can yeah. go anywhere. So you have a lot of, if you go to a lot of these states on the borders, you actually find like in Utah, as an example, the police or on the borders, waiting for people to come out of Colorado with marijuana, as an example, okay? Because it's legal in the state, but not outside the state. So right. they're trying to stop people bringing it out. So we get into the situation, we've talked about dosage, we've that, those types of questions, but when you look at the product, for example, in the gel caps, you have uh, 900 milligram and 450 milligram. What's sure. the difference between the two? Yeah. So on the two patent, very good question, and, and we'll be a little clearer on the labeling. So I think I made a bit of a mistake when it happened, but all that means is there are 15 milligram tablets. So the 450 actually has 30 capsules, and the 900 milligram has 60 capsules. So the capsule strength is the same, it's just number of capsules in the bottle. So that's total amount of active ingredient. In the bottle. In the bottle. Because a lot of people look at pricing of how much active ingredient am I paying, so how many cents per milligram. So we do that way to help them. And the same with the Ananda 200. There are 200 milligrams of active ingredient. Um, there's a 600 milligram bottle as well. That just happens to be three times as strong. And so in one drop before you get three times more active ingredient in the other. And a lot of times children use it. You know, for example, children who don't, if you have a, an indication that requires a lot of cannabinoid and don't want to take three droppers of oil, you take one that's three times stronger. So it's a volume issue. Right. Okay. okay. All right. So it's really pretty simple, but people want to look at it and think, make it difficult. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, 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 a doctor can approach it from the standpoint of just the number of tablets that someone, or not exactly. tablets, the number of gel caps someone wants to take. Exactly. Or, or, and certainly the 600 would stretch the usage of the, uh, of the tincture exactly. and how you're going to use it uh, in, in a dropper full or, or not, how that, how that would apply. Excellent. That's right. And are there any changes from the concept of dealing with a doctor? Do you, do you see any changes as far as how a doctor may be able to purchase it uh, for their use uh, in terms of quantity? 
the amount that they can purchase to the larger oh, bottles or, or yeah. what, whatever? Okay, is there, what's going on there? Yeah, so what we're doing is this, Pat, is we are creating, we've got feedback. So we've listened, we listen to our consumers. And so some people want a, a much larger bottle for a much longer supply. So we will look at making the 1,000 and 3,000. So those are just much, much larger dosage um, in terms of quantity that people can buy um, from that. And we're also coming out in sort of late Q1 2018. We'll have a THC-free product. I think we've gotten some feedback. Obviously, people worry about drug testing. And so the THC-free product, like I said, won't have any THC in it. So you'll test, you won't test positive for THC. Um, but some people like the THC in it because it, they view it has a better effect on their system. So it'll give people the option to pick between the two. But you're doing studies or you're looking at the, the difference the between the two. So people that do want that without THC, they'll be able to, to do Absolutely. that and, and yes. uh, achieve the results that they're, that they're looking for. That's something that from our pr perspective at MagnaWave, again, why did we get involved with this and why do we want to do this? Our whole goal is to help doctors better take care of their clients. They want to, we know that you do want to take care of your clients. You want to help them be healthier, uh, live happier lives. And so we try to bring things to you that can aid your practice from that perspective. The idea that you can use it as a profit center is fine. We can talk profit centers all day long, but I know what you're looking for because it's what I'm looking for and it's how I got involved with things is something that's going to help my clients, help them be healthier and happier. Yeah, and I say, Pat, we know we're very happy that we're very, very happy and pleased to be partnering with Magna Wave because the philosophy and what you do is very aligned to what we do in terms of it's patient first um, and the most effective and efficient treatment for them. And and like I said, it's not always the mainstream that that works. It's sometimes people have to really, really, um, you know, work on alternative solutions that uh, that work a lot better. So sure. We're very happy to be partnered with you, Pat. Thank you very much. We're glad we're glad to be here, and we're glad to be working with you as well. Thank you. Thank you. So what we've done is we've talked a lot about the, the background, some of the history from Australia and that whole aspect of the Ananda products. But when you talk about production and growing and the farm and, and the farm bill and how all of that happened, Brian Furnish is with me and, and he's the man. He was very instrumental in the farm bill and how it happened, spent years doing that. And uh, so I wanted to visit with Brian to so you could hear that history and we can discuss that so you can better understand how serious they are with this product and their processes. So Brian, thank you for being with us. He's the director of global production for Ananda, Brian Furnish. Got a little farm out here in Cynthiana, Kentucky. That's a beautiful farm. Spent an afternoon there and loved it. Had a great time. So Brian, thank you for being with us. Give us a little bit of background about your farm and about how you got involved in, in the process in Washington. Yeah, thank you, Pat. I'm an eighth generation tobacco farmer from Cynthiana, Kentucky, just north of Lexington. My family has been traditional farmers for many, many, many years. And I worked in, a, uh, a work in Washington, D.C. on legislation for many years for tobacco. And then I spent four years working for the governor of Kentucky and then went back to the tobacco cooperative and traveled around the world selling tobacco. And in 2012, our commissioner of agriculture, James Comer, asked me to get involved in the hemp legislation. And out of a friendship and courtesy to him, I agreed to move forward with that. I didn't know a whole lot about hemp at the time, but started to get uh, very interested in educating myself because I thought it might be a good replacement to help farmers stay on the farm who had lost all their tobacco income. And uh, agriculture has changed a lot in the last 20 to 30 years since I've been in farming. And so we need another tool to give to the farmers. And so we started in 2013 on a bill in Kentucky called Senate Bill 50. And we got that bill passed right at the deadline of that uh, legislative session. And it stated that if federal law changed, that Kentucky could start growing hemp again. And that would be the first time it would be legal since uh, basically the 1930s when it was outlawed. Uh, there was a short period of time during World War II that some hemp was grown, but that was just because of the war effort. So once we had the bill in Kentucky in hand, we went to Washington, D.C. and worked with Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky, Congressman Thomas Massey, Congressman Andy Barr, and uh, got some leg like legislation introduced, but we were having a hard time in the Senate. And so we uh, started working a lot with Senator Rand Paul and Senator Mitch McConnell, got them educated on the fact that we didn't want to be in the marijuana business, that we wanted to be in the hemp business, and that we wanted to create a commodity to help farmers stay on farms, but also created jobs. And so in the 2014 Farm Bill, we inserted language that said 
that any state that had a current law in place could start growing hemp again. And so uh, once that passed, it gave us a leg up here in Kentucky. So I was the first licensed grower in the United States to get licensed to legally grow hemp in 2014. Wow. So you were the first legally allowed to grow hemp. Yeah, legally under federal law, I was the first farmer licensed to grow. And and so what did you do at that point? You you were you hooked up with Ananda at that point in time? No, I wasn't. no you're you're okay. I started getting phone calls from people from all over the world who wanted to be in the hemp business in Kentucky. And after two or three questions about their true interest, most of them uh, had no idea what hemp was, had no idea how to get uh, seed to start hemp, had nothing, no knowledge of the equipment or knowledge of product. And so after about 150 phone calls over a two-month period, uh, a gentleman from Australia got in touch with me. Uh, he had contacted the governor's office, the University of Kentucky, and they said that he should come and visit with me. And so he came to my farm and we visited, and he, had, he has 18 years of experience with hemp in Australia at that time. So he and I formed a partnership in Kentucky, just called Kentucky Industrial Hemp. And we started uh, trying to get seed in from uh, Australia so I could start growing it on my farm. Our first shipment of seed was seized by the DEA in Louisville, and along with Commissioner uh, Comer and the law firm in Lexington, we sued the DEA in federal court, and we won on all six counts. And the judge scolded the DEA and told them to get out of the way of farming and let me farm, and told them they had two days, I think, to approve my application. So we went down that path, and then um, uh, started doing the research and learned how to grow it uh, 2014 and 2015. And then in 2015, that's when I met Barry Lambert and Eric Wong, who came to my farm and visited, and they decided to make an investment in what I was doing here. And then uh, Nanda Hemp was created out of that. So tell us, tell me about the, the, the growth process. What kind of regulations do you have to, to go through? I mean, you kept telling me when I was at the farm, look at it, but don't pick it up and take it with you. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm highly scrutinized. I, every year I have to go through an intense application process. I have to do a criminal background check every year. I have to have GPS coordinates of all my fields turned into the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, who then turns that over to the state police. Uh, they can come and check my fields anytime they want to to make sure I'm not growing marijuana there. Then uh, two weeks before harvest, I have to contact them and they have to come and pull a sample on all my fields. And if any of my product in the field test above 0.3 THC, I have to destroy it. After a second test, I would have to destroy it. Have you had that happen? I did have to destroy four acres of a new variety that we had never grown before because it tested high in THC. So we... I planted a thousand acres and we've harvested 996 acres of it, which is pretty, really remarkable. Being a new crop in a new state and new genetics, we've done really well. So, how many how many acres are you farming now? Uh, this year, our uh, Nanda Hemp has contracted about 500 acres with I think seven farmers. Um, my brothers and I grow about 200 acres of that. And so the, the process, you, you grow it, you harvest it, and then it goes to the, do you do any part of the processing prior to it going to the lab? What do you, what's yeah, involved uh, there? In my role as director of global productions, I control everything from the original genetics that came from Australia. Uh, well, we have those in Kentucky, and we do everything from growing the genetics out for future repropagation all the way to uh, growing the crop, processing, extracting, and getting ready to go into a final product. We do all that right there in our farm in Cincinnati. So you were telling me, and I think this is just something that people will find interesting. You were telling me when I was at the farm, and, and it was a wonderful day, by the way. The weather was great. The farm was great. But the, the process that when you're growing, uh, you have pollinization that takes place with the hemp products, and that, that the illegal growers of marijuana that affects their crops. So it, it, and I would think that the legal people would be happy to have a hemp farm because it messes up the, the people that are doing it illegally. Is that right? Yeah, the way Ananda hemp grows is we grow it from seed, which is naturally occurring. So we have males and females. So the males put pollen back into the air. My pollen can travel up to three to five miles through the air. Just, by, just the simple breeze can blow the pollen. So if there's anyone growing uh, marijuana or anything within a, a three to five mile radius, uh, 
my pollen can affect their future hemp, their future illegal crops. So uh, in the beginning, the two people that opposed this in the legislation were the law enforcement and the marijuana growers. So that was kind of interesting. <laughs> so it doesn't help their plants benefit. No. Yeah. It, okay. No, most illegal marijuana growers do not want us anywhere in the area where they are. Anywhere near where the, where they're where they're growing. So now, what do you see happening for the for the farmers in Kentucky and other states? Is it going to be a good cash crop for them? Yeah, I think uh, you know it's still a fairly new crop when you compare it to soybeans or corn or wheat. But uh, we've saw a tremendous amount of growth in Kentucky. We the first year we had I think thirty or forty acres in the ground. This year there's about five thousand acres planted in Kentucky. So it's a tremendous growth in the last three years. 5,000 acres in Kentucky. 5,000 acres were planted in 2017 in Kentucky. Uh, nationwide, I think about 15 or 16,000 acres of hemp was planted this year. And I look for that number to triple next year. Now, and something that, that Eric and I did not get much into, but the aspect of taking your growing hemp for medicinal purposes but you also have plans to grow hemp for for the fabric, and can you tell us a little yeah, bit about so that? I think main, people will enjoy that. Three main uses for the hemp plant. You can grow it for seed, which is used for oils or for protein food for human consumption. You can uh, grow the flower, which we're growing for what we call for a dietary supplement uh, for people to help them feel better or many different things. Or you can grow the stalk for fiber, which is we're uh, doing testing on it for high-end clothing, uh, possibly automobile parts, many different things. And so there's, it's a very dynamic plant. And as a company and myself individually, I grow it for all three purposes. So, and and it's your farm, but is there, can you grow all three in our area or do you, are you going to capitalize on the various areas of the state or? Yeah. Um, for the fiber and food production, it will go to the areas of the state or country where uh, traditionally row crop farming is similar to corn and soybeans because you need bigger uh, fields, uh, something to take a bigger piece of equipment into. For the but the green material, what I'm doing for the dietary supplement, um, it'll be grown more in the old traditional tobacco areas, the smaller fields, a lot more labor intensive, the infrastructure. And so in Kentucky, we're very lucky we have built-in technology and infrastructure that was there for tobacco that fits in very well with what we're doing with the full-spectrum hemp oil product. So it, it's got to be an interesting feeling for yourself to have been involved with this from the very beginning at, at, at the level of Congress and the state levels, and, and now to be to be producing a crop that is so, the, the opportunities medicinally are huge just a question, how do you, how does that make you feel to grow this type of crop as compared to a tobacco kind of crop? Well, it's a whole lot easier for me to travel around the world now and say that I'm a hemp grower that's doing all these wonderful things with hemp. Because when I was in the tobacco, which my family still has to grow the tobacco to sustain the farm, uh, that's not the easiest thing to travel around the world because I've done that. And I've traveled to 65 countries promoting tobacco before. Then I, people thought I was the devil. You know, because I was promoting tobacco. But the reality was I was promoting a legal crop that was safely grown, and we knew it was better than what they were consuming from other countries. But it is quite a story of being an eighth-generation tobacco farmer who's now in the hemp business, who's helping save people, making their lives better, hopefully saving their lives, and hopefully in the near future being able to clothe people in a sustainable way. Because hemp, hemp is such a sustainable crop, I don't need insecticides or pesticides or fungicides to grow my crop. It grows naturally in Kentucky. Natural rainfall. If I can get it planted and uh, get it out of the ground and keep the weeds out of it, this plant just takes off. It's unbelievable. I, last so what, year I grew stalks that were 22 foot tall in, in less than three months. So if someone talking about the organic, organic nature of the products that they're going to consume without the need for pesticides and that stuff. You really fit the organic type category? Yeah, I'm not certified organic as a farmer, but our products are clean and natural and basically are organic. Just my land's not certified because I can't afford to take my land out of production for three to five years to get certification. That's what you have to do to get cert take it out of production to make sure that it's... You can't put anything on it that's not so-called man or that's man-made or it has to be from the earth. 
a lot of quirky rules. And so, but we are non GMO, uh, natural, every, all the buzzwords in the health world, we basically meet all of those. Tell us a little bit about the seed. Came from Australia. Yeah, the original source of seed, our founder uh, and my partner, original partner, Phil Warner, uh, grew up on a farm and went off and uh, made uh, videos and commercials and movies as a producer. But he always wanted to get back to what they call the bush in Australia. And that's kind of the outback, kind of where the farming happens. It, but there weren't a lot of jobs. Jobs were leaving the bush and leaving Australia. And so he started looking at other crops that could be beneficial. And out of all that research, they kept coming back to hemp. And so he got started on it, traveled all over the world, gathering up genetics and taking it back to Australia and breeding to see what they would do. Reality is, is Australia does not have the best laws for producing hemp and selling hemp products. So when the law changed in the United States and Kentucky became the first state to legally do it under the Farm Bill, it was a perfect fit because we had the farmers, the land, the natural resources to grow it here. And just needed the good seeds. Exactly. Everything, every, doesn't matter what you do, it starts with seed. That's right. Where does the CBD come from? Well, the, the cannabinoids, and uh, CBD is just one of the cannabinoids. So in full spectrum, we have multiple cannabinoids in our product. But the, the cannabinoids come from the green material from the bud of the plant. There's a lot of confusion because uh, federal law, based on the 2004 DEA case, says that products can be imported if they come from the seed or the stalk. So a lot of people are bringing in uh, CBD products or full-spectrum oil products from foreign countries and claim it comes from the seed and the stalk. The reality is... I could grow 500 acres and you couldn't get enough CBD out of the stalk and the stem to create one of these products. So uh, companies are skirting around that law just to get it into the country. But it's one advantage we have. It's a domestic product and we know it's coming from the flower. So we don't have to worry about future laws or future um, issues that come up with trade or imports. So it actually comes from the flower. Is it? Is Can you see it? I mean, when, when you have the flower, what... Yeah, when you're growing the plant, it gets matured closer to harvest. You'll see the crystals. The crystals actually on the leaf and the buds. If I had some pictures I could show you, you could see it. It's like a shiny crystal that lights up in light or sunshine. So that's what you, it's actually, you take that off of the leaf in some fashion through yeah, your process. Yeah, after it naturally cures in our tobacco bones, we take it into an uh, extraction process and it pulls those off. So how much in your process of farming do you manage? Of course, obviously they test it for THC. What do you have to do to manage that level of TSC in your farming process? Well, it all starts with the genetics. You know, if you've got a good seed source that's certified, that you know every year when you produce it, that it'll stay below 0.3 3 THC when you're pretty safe. Now, the challenge is, is the way we grow it naturally here in Kentucky and outside, outside conditions, Sometimes the amount of moisture or rainfall you have, sometimes the temperature could affect the THC level a little bit. So it's kind of a gamble for us every year. You know, there's a slight chance every year that they could come and it could be a little too high and there might be part of it you have to retest. Um, but as long as we're doing a good job and trying not to break the rules and they know we're not marijuana growers, they will work with us. But it is a, it is a test. They, I cannot have a product of any kind that's above 0.3 THC. So how did you, when you went to Washington, just tell me how that happened. I mean, did you call somebody and say, I'm coming and I got this stuff? or what? <laughs> uh, just tell me how that happened, what yeah. it was like. Well, it all started when I got out of college. You know, I was about 21 years old, and uh, my employer at the time took me to Washington, and I could explain what I, the issues uh uh, pretty quickly and I could get the point across pretty quickly and I was the same age as the staff people that works in Washington and these, and these firms and these offices are very young college graduates and so I just formed a good relationship with those people and they understood that I was really telling the truth and I was coming from a farming perspective and I wasn't there uh, doing a sales pitch I was just telling the exact nature of why I was there and then when uh, our Commissioner of Agriculture, James Comer, asked me to get involved. One of the reasons he asked me is because he knew I had a deep heritage in agriculture in Kentucky, but I also understood policy work in Frankfurt and Washington. 
I'm not a lobbyist. I've never been paid to lobby Congress, but I'm very effective because in about three or four minutes, I can get my point across, and then I leave them alone. And so a lot of them will call me now and ask me questions about what should happen, not just on hemp, but any any issue in general as far as agriculture or Kentucky. A lot of them will reach out to me. A lot of them will come to my farm and visit. They want to see what we're doing. It's it's just a good relationship, and they learn to trust certain people. And luckily, I've been one of those people they reach out to. So you you went to Washington. You talked with them. Uh, They were receptive to to what you were doing. But most of them were receptive. It's a constant education process on what hemp is, what it'll do, how it benefits Kentucky, how it can fix jobs, how it's grown. Uh, most days I'm educating someone on, on what hemp is and what it does. So the products that come out in from outside of the country, when they say they're coming from the seed or from the stalk, is, is that a way for them to bring this in legally? Uh, or, or, or how do you know what you're getting? You don't. Uh, you don't. It all comes down to marketing and uh, promotion, and nobody's really testing the product. The reality is if the government wanted to stop some of this importing of products, they probably could in the future. But for our company, we don't focus on that. We're focused on trying to unify the industry, make positive changes, and then let free market take over. And the winners will win, and the, and the ones who are not as good will fail. That's free market business, and that's how it works, and that's what we're asking for. And as a farmer, that's what we want. You know, if it's a legitimate business, which I think it is, then let us farm it. Just, you know, get out of our way and let us do it and let business people like you figure out how to make a living or make money off of it and get the product out there. Well, and the biggest thing to me is that you're testing it, you're growing it right, you're doing all those things, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, because it'll work. And I think you're absolutely right. The free market system, if it doesn't work, it won't be here. Yeah, and the people who are not doing it properly or who are bringing it in under uh, laws or issues that are not for real, eventually people will figure that out over time. If we do the right thing and do it right and know we have a good product that's been tested thoroughly by third-party individuals, then I feel comfortable giving it to my own children and to my mom and my grandparents. And I wouldn't just give anything to my own children. So that's what I feel about our product. And I feel it's a very safe product, and I feel like it it can benefit everyone in a different way, and everyone should try it. People say, well, I can't really afford that. I say, I don't see how you can afford not to. You know, if you sleep better and you feel better and you're not in pain, that that becomes a long way. I can tell you firsthand, I have this conversation every day with somebody. They talk about my the Magnum products and what they do, and, and I'll, sit, I'll say to them, I say, the only reason we're having this conversation mm-hmm. is because it works. I mean, it's been a very expensive machine for years, and people wouldn't buy it if it didn't work. And it works. Same with this product. Exactly. If it, if it didn't work, people wouldn't be selling out. Exactly. Sixty or eighty or a hundred dollars in Cincinnati, Kentucky, to buy this product, but a lot of people are. So it must be doing something. Right. Right. And and I think that's the bottom line. And I, I applaud you for for having the dedication to go develop it, to spend the time, to push it through, help it get it through, push through Congress, to to have the the knowledge and the understanding to hook up with the people uh, like Eric and, and the other folks to, to make it something that's really going to be beneficial for, for your customers, our customers, and everybody in general. Well, sometimes in life you just get lucky to be in the right place at the right time, so... It's, that's the way I see it. And, you know, getting legislation passed sometimes is the easiest part. Sometimes after the legislation passed is the hard part. That's execution. And then right now I'm going back to Washington every month because we're working on new legislation to free it up to where our company can do more research with Thomas Jefferson University and others so that we can prove through uh, studies and trials what this actually does do. So that's another issue. We need to get part of the government out of the way so we can do the research so we can prove it to you. What are some studies that are that are being planned or that are taking place? Well, there's a lot of different things that we want to study. Uh, the effects on sleep, the effects on pain, the effects on anxiety. There's, there's many different things that we would like to look at. And so far, there's been no real scientific research or studies being done. Everything's anecdotal. Right. Well, eventually, 
our company through Barry Lambert's generous donations of forty million dollars to universities and hospitals, we want to know why. You know, how much should a person be taking? How much should a kid take? How much should I take? Uh, if I'm taking it for sleep or I'm taking it for anxiety or pain, how much should I take and why? And this, this is the proof. This many people did it, and this was the effect. How many players out there are going to the limits with regard to the Lambert's $40 million doctorates in in can in, in studies of CBD, how many people are, are approaching it from the direction that you guys are? I don't know of any company that I'm aware of, and I work with a lot of them in my role. I don't know of any company that's made that kind of sizable contribution to research and to the science. Now, there's a lot of good companies that are trying to do the right thing and do uh, testing and not make claims, and so there's companies out there we're working with. But $40 million dollars, from one individual who's the chairman of our company for research is a huge donation to this industry. And it's a huge shot in the arm. From a farmer standpoint, I get excited about it. somebody wants to put $40 million into research and something I'm growing on my farm. That has never happened in my life. So really, you're, you're making advances. You're performing studies by virtue of, of what's happening with the Lamberts and everybody else that's really going to help your competitors. Exactly, but there's enough... I truly believe with this plant that the research will prove it out and there's enough room for everybody in this industry. It's a huge industry. It's a huge, it's growing rapidly. I mean, I, the round table that I chair, our members that serve on there this year alone will sell over $200 million worth of product. Two years ago, those companies didn't have any sales. So I think there's a lot of room for opportunity. And we're not competing against other hemp companies. We're competing against Advil or Tylenol or Aleve exactly. or Ambien. That's the thing we're, we're competing against. And, and so that's our competition is pharmaceutical companies, not another hemp company. There's plenty There's plenty of business for everybody. Exactly. As long as they're following the rules and playing fair and not making up false claims and statements, then there's room for them. Tell now, us so about your association. You started an association, self-regulatory. Well, there's a couple different roles. I, I help start something called the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, and the goal there was to unify the industry around one common goal, and that is to create good laws in this country to protect this industry. And so now we have uh, 35 members. We just raised about $450,000 to work on lobbying issue efforts, uh, legislation efforts in Washington. That's one role of our U.S. Hemp Roundtable. The other role is something that I've been pushing for the last two years is to uh, create a self-regulatory organization and what that is is basically a self-policing of the industry by ourselves so that we can go to the branches of the federal government and say, look, we're doing the right thing and here's what we're doing. A good example of an SRO that people are familiar with is a Certified Angus Bee. That's a nonprofit self-regulatory organization that says if you meet certain quality standards and follow certain rules and protocols, you can put this seal on your meat product. It's one of the most recognized meat symbols in the world right now. And so I want to do the same thing for hemp as what they've done in these other industries. And there's many examples out there. But when I go to Washington, I can look to the FDA or the DEA or USDA and say, look, we're, we're policing ourselves and here it is. Here's our procedure. Here's our protocol. And if you follow it, you can put this seal on your product that says you follow this. And at that point, hopefully we'll be able to figure out who's following the rules properly and who's not. And that's part of the reason for doing all this. And, and and are your competitors or people receptive to that? Yeah, through the round table, the top hemp companies in the United States have all joined in and supported what we're trying to do. And we've kicked off the process. Uh, phase one is beginning in 2018. There'll be three phases to it. First phase is voluntary, and the third phase will be mandatory. And it's sort of like a seal of approval if you do all these things sure all the way from the genetics on my farm to the farm workers being certified to me as a farmer being a gap certified which stands for good agriculture practices all the way to gmp facilities for manufacturing all the way through the process you'll have to meet certain things what we're trying to do is keep the, the guys from making a product in their garage and uh, getting it to someone that makes them sick that's what we're trying to stop right we want 
an industry that sustains itself and protects the consumer, and that's what we're asking. Excellent. Absolutely excellent. And I think that speaks, again, to where we are with MagnaWave. Good synergistic products, things that will help you know that you're dealing with a product that is well-documented, well-tested, well-established, proper studies behind it, everything, they're crossing their T's, dotting their I's to give you uh, a product that you can feel very safe and comfortable to pass along to your clients for their health and wellness. And we know that's what you want to do is make people healthier and, and happier. And that's what that's the, that's the whole goal here. And, and from our perspective, we don't want to put it in our perspective that you have to turn around and say, hey, you want to be in this business, you got to buy hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of products. We're trying to set it up so you, if you want to stock it in your, in your office, you can do that. If you want to do it on a drop ship type situation from your website or from your emails to your customers, you can do that so you can help satisfy their needs, take care of your clients, and do it in a way that's comfortable for you uh, to learn this product and to learn how to use it uh, as as this whole business grows. So we think it's it was important for us to try to align with someone that we felt was above the fold. And, and we feel that you're the same way. You want to align yourself with people and companies that are watching out for your clients and your customers for their health and wellness. So thanks for being with us. And uh, if you have any questions, give us a call. And if we can't answer them, we'll get with Eric or Brian and get your questions answered.